But when we read history, we come to know that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, met Warqa only twice in his life. Once, before he claimed prophethood, when he was worshipping the Kaaba, and he kissed the forehead of the Prophet. And the other time, when the first Wahi was revealed to the Prophet, and when the Prophet was scared and shivering, his wife takes him to Warqa, only on two occasions. And immediately after the first Wahi was revealed, the first revelation was given, three years later he dies. And this Quran continued to be revealed for 22 and a half years. So imagine, Prophet met him only twice, how could he learn from him? And he died three years after meeting him the last time, after the way he started. So surely he could not have learned from Warqa. He was a Christian Arab. He was Arab, but he had converted to Christianity. But surely he could not have learned from him. There are some people who say that the Prophet, he learned about the Quran from the Jews and Christians when he spent time with them. We know that the Prophet gave da'wah to the Jews and Christians after going to Medina, 13 years after the revelation started. So surely he could not have learned from them. And in the discussions, it was the Prophet who was giving them information, not the vice versa. And many of the people who he discussed with, many of them accepted Islam. So it was the Prophet who was helping them, not they were helping Prophet. Furthermore, some people say that may be learned from people outside Arabia. And we know that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he went outside Makkah before claiming prophethood only thrice. Once to Medina at the age of six. Second time between the age of nine and 11, he goes along with his uncle to Syria for a business trip. And he goes at the age of 25 to Syria when he takes the caravan of Hazrat Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. He only goes outside Makkah thrice. So to say that he went outside thrice and he learned everything of the Quran in these three occasions is absurd. Furthermore, we realize it's illogical that the Prophet could have learned from somebody else because he was so busy. He was always surrounded by the people. He was always kept busy by the people meeting him, so much so that the Quran says that give the Prophet a rest. So if he met some people, surely this thing would have been exposed in history. And the enemies of the Prophet were always keeping a watch on him. If he really met someone secretly, surely he would have been exposed. Furthermore, one historical fact that the Prophet was illiterate is sufficient to dispel all these theories that he copied from somewhere else. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 48, that you were not able to recite any book before this, before this book came, nor were you able to transcribe any other book before this. Or else, the talkers of vanity would have doubted. That means, Almighty God, who has all the wisdom, he knew that people will allege that this Quran has been written by the Prophet. So he saw to it that the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an illiterate, was Ummi, not even giving a point to the critics, which is hardly big enough to even hang a fly. Allah is not even giving a small chance to the talkers of vanity, even giving the slightest excuse that someone would say that the Prophet wrote the Quran. And it's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157. It says that they follow the unlettered prophet who is mentioned in the law and gospels, mentioned in the scriptures. Here it says that the prophet would be unlettered, illiterate. And we find that there are several prophecies of Prophet Muhammad in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament several times mentioned in the Bible. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12, that the book will be given to thee who is not learned. And when it will be said to him, pray, read this, he will say, I am not learned. And this is exactly what happened 
when the first revelation, Wahi, came to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and when Archangel Gabriel said, Ikra, read, he replied, Ma na bikhari, I am not learned. So surely, the Prophet, being an illiterate, could not have copied from somewhere else. History tells us today that the first Arabic version of the Bible, the Arabic version, translation of the Bible did not exist when the prophet was alive. The first version of the Old Testament was written by R. Sadian Gyos in 900 CE, about more than 250 years after the death of the prophet. And the first Arabic New Testament was written or translated by Erpenius in the year 1616, about 1,000 years after the demise of the prophet. So where is the question of the prophet coming from the Bible? There are many people who say that the prophet knows Billah. He copied the Quran from the Bible. And we do agree that there are similarities between the Bible and the Quran. No, just because there is similarity between the Bible and the Quran, that does not mean the Quran has been copied from the Bible. There is a possibility that both of them have a common source. And we know that the source of all the revelations was one true Almighty God. Suppose a student A, in the examination, he copies from the textbook of science. And student B also copies from the textbook of science. That does not mean B has copied from A or A has copied from B. Both copied from the original source, the textbook of science. Similarly, the source of all the revelations, it is Almighty God. And furthermore, if anyone copies from someone, he will never write the name of the person who he has copied from. The Quran gives due respect to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. If he had copied from the Bible, why should he give respect to Jesus, peace be upon him? If a person copies from his neighbor, he will not mention that my neighbor is a good person or my neighbor is very intelligent in science. So if the prophet copied from the Bible, why does he give due respect to Moses, Jesus, peace be upon him, and all the prophets? If we say that the Quran has been copied from the Bible because there are common points, then we can say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, knows Billah, he has copied from the Old Testament because there are similarities between the Old and the New Testament. We know that the similarities are because both have a common source that is one Almighty God. We come to know that in Islam, there are four revelations. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. The Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation given to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And the Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even though all the revelations, all the scriptures that came before the Quran, they have not maintained the pure form. They have been corrupted. They have been changed. Yet, there are many parts of the scriptures which yet are the same. So if you have to check what is correct, you have to check with the Furqan, that is the glorious Quran. If it matches the Quran, we have no problem in accepting that portion of that scripture to be the word of God. There may be many human beings who may not be knowing or having a knowledge of the Quran or the Bible. So how can we decipher which of the two is right or who has copied from whom? The best test is the test of science. If we put these two scriptures to the test of science, we will know the difference of chalk and chiefs. When we read superficially, we come to know that the Bible and the Quran are the same. But if we do a research or we analyze it, we come to know that the difference of chalk and chiefs. When we read the Bible, it's mentioned in the first book of the Bible, book of Genesis, chapter number one, that Almighty God, he created the heaven and the earth in six days. And these six days are 24 hours days, mentioned in the Bible. The Quran, too, speaks about the creation of the universe and says, Almighty God has created the heaven and the earth in six ayams. Ayam is plural of yom. One of the meaning of yom is a 24-hour day, but the other Arabic meaning of yom 
is a long period, an epoch. Today, scientists, they say that our universe was created in billions of years. So to say it was created in 624 days is wrong. But the scientists have got no objection with the Quran when the Quran says the heavens and the earth were created in six ayams. That is, six long periods without defining them to be strict 24 hours. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Bible, in the first book, book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number three to five, that Almighty God, he created the day and the night on the first day. And he created the light on the first day. It later says in Genesis chapter number one, verse 14 to 19, the source of light, that is, the stars and the sun, they were created on the fourth day. Imagine, the effect is created on the first day and the cause of the effect on the fourth day. The sun was created and the stars on the fourth day and the light from the sun and the star was created on the first day. It's illogical. How can the effect come before the source? Quran 2 speaks about the creation of the heavens and the earth but does not give this unscientific sequence. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the first book of the Bible, book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number nine to 13, that the earth was created on the third day and Genesis chapter number one, verse number 14 to 19, that the sun and the moon was created on the fourth day. We know from science that the earth and the moon are the part of the parent body that is the sun. So to say that the earth was created before the parent body, the sun, is unscientific. The Quran too speaks about creation of the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the earth, but it says it was created simultaneously. Imagine Prophet Muhammad copied from the Bible and he changed the sequence. He says, no, both were created together. Bible further says, in the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number nine to 13, that Almighty God created the vegetables and the vegetations on the third day. And Genesis chapter number one, verse 14 to 19, he created the sun on the fourth day. Scientifically, it's not possible that the vegetation can survive without sunlight. It's totally unscientific. Furthermore, the Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse number 16, that Almighty God created two great lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. The Bible says the light of the sun as well as the light of the moon is its own light. The Bible says the light of the moon has its own light. But the Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. So imagine the prophet copied from the Bible and he made corrections. Not the own light, it is a reflected light. It's not humanly possible. Only one who has this knowledge is Almighty God. There are several examples, we can give a talk only on this. And I had a debate with Dr. William Campbell on the topic, the Quran and the Bible in the light of science. And there, I've mentioned many unscientific points mentioned in the Bible. Time does not permit me to go into details. The various unscientific things mentioned in the Bible, which is not mentioned in the Quran. For example, according to the Bible, Adam, peace be upon him. He came into existence about 5,800 years before. Science tells us that the human beings came into existence millions of years before. The Quran too speaks about Adam and Salam, but does not give a date. The Bible says in Genesis, chapter number six, seven, as well as eight, about Noah and the flood. And it says that the full world was submerged underwater. At the time of Noah, that is approximately 21st, 22nd century BC. Quran too speaks about Noah and Salam but it does not give it a date. It even speaks about the flood, but it says it was a localized flood, only it flooded the Ummah, the people of Nuh al not the full world. Today, archaeological evidence shows us that the 11th dynasty of Egypt, as well as the third dynasty of Babylon, they existed without interruption since the 21st, 22nd century BC. 
psychological evidence says that what is mentioned in the Bible is totally wrong. There are various examples, we can give hundreds, time does not permit. So surely, this Quran has not been copied from the Bible. Neither it has been forged. As mentioned in the Quran in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 1 and 2. It says that, do they say he forged it? Nay, it is the truth from the Lord. So that he may give admonition to the people to whom no warner has come in the past. So surely, we can undoubtedly say that neither Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the author of the Quran, neither did he copy or plagiarize or learn it from any other source. Furthermore, we know that the glorious Quran, unlike other religious scriptures, or unlike other story books which are written by human beings, it has a particular beginning. Once upon a time, foxes and the grapes, once upon a time, lamp and the wolf, that the Bible says, in the beginning was God, in the beginning was the word. Typical. And every storybook will have a sequence. Sequence, you know, a beginning and an end in a serial order. But the Quran is unique. The first verse to reveal of the Quran Iqra is not the first chapter, chapter number one. It is chapter 96, Surah Iqra, Surah Allah, verse number one. It doesn't have a sequence. It does not start with Adam alayhi salam, and then it continues and goes to Noah alayhi salam, and Musa alayhi salam, then Jesus, peace be upon him, then Muhammad, peace be upon him. No. It has a unique sequence. It does not work like a human mind. Because the author is not a human being. Furthermore, there are unknown things mentioned in the Quran. Along with it, there's a challenge saying that you do not know it. For example, it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse 49, saying that you did not know this before, neither the people amongst you knew it. It gives an information and says, Oh, Prophet, you did not know it, not even your people knew it. It's mentioned in Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12. Verse number two, that none amongst you knew it, neither the Prophet knew it. Imagine the Prophet saying, when the Quran was revealed in Arabia, he's telling to the Arabs, neither I knew it, neither you did not know it. Any Arab could have got up, he could have said that I'm an Arab and I know this answer. This I knew it before. The Quran mentioned many incidences, many things about Lulqanen, about the story of the caves, many information, and says you did not know. Which human being who can write this book and say you did not know it before? Indicating this does not have a human origin. Furthermore, some people say that the Quran is a deception. When we ask them, what is the origin of the deception? They give no answer. Can you point out a single deception in the Quran? They cannot answer. So how can you say something which you cannot logically prove? There are some people who tell a false thing, who make a false statement, and they fool themselves by sticking to it. For example, suppose there's a person who thinks Mr. A is an enemy. He thinks. He does not have any logical proof. He has no reason. But he thinks, he falsely believes that Mr. A, he is my enemy. The moment he meets Mr. A, that person starts behaving like an enemy to Mr. A. Now, Mr. A being a human being, he retaliates. Why is he treating me as an enemy? He retaliates. The moment Mr. A retaliates, the person says, ah, didn't I tell you? He is my enemy. See, they are retaliating to me. So you make a false statement, and you fool yourself, by sticking to the statement, this is what the critics of Islam do. They make a false statement and they fool themselves by sticking to it. Furthermore, the Quran, it believes in reasoning. And there are several verses which talk about reasoning. You can analyze it, you can discuss the matter of the Quran. Several places, including Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse 52, that here is the message for mankind. 
Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. Many Muslims think that the Quran discourages reasoning. It discourages arguing with people. It discourages discussing about the Quran with others and religion with others. In fact, the Quran encourages that you have to discuss with the other human beings. You have to argue with the other human beings. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of their Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Quran encourages reasoning and arguing and discussing, but with hikmah and husna in ways that are best and most gracious. There is something known as exhausting the alternatives. There is a concept known as exhausting the alternatives. The Quran says, this is from God. If you don't believe in it, you tell me what it is from. You tell me from where it is. The Quran says, this book is from God. This book is from Allah. If you disagree, you give me the answer. So someone will say, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he wrote the Quran. And we proved earlier he didn't write. He lied. Why did he lie? Because of material gains. And we proved it's not possible. Maybe for power and glory. And we proved that's not possible. Maybe for unity of the Arabs. And we proved that's not possible. Someone will say, okay, did for moral reformation. And we proved it's not possible. Guess, guess. Okay, you copied from the Bible. And we proved it is wrong. Guess. When all your guesses are proved wrong, that means the Quran requires to be heard. It requires respect. You have to believe in it that this book, Quran, is from Almighty God. And Quran says in several places that this book is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 1 and 2, where it says, Ha Meem, Tanzeerul Kitab bin Allahi, Azizul Hakim. That ha meme, this is a revelation of the book from the Lord of the worlds, exalted in power and full of wisdom. The Quran says in several places that this book is the book of Almighty God. It's mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 19. Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 93. It's mentioned in Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, verse number 1 and 2. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 113. It is mentioned in Surah Sajda. Chapter number 32, verse number 1 to 3. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 1 to 3. It's mentioned in Surah Azumur, chapter number 39, verse number 1. In Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 2. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 2. It is mentioned in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 1 and 2. It's mentioned in Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 23, that this book, the glorious Quran, is from none other but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is known as exhausting the alternatives. What you have, you give. You try it out. If you fail to prove it logically, then you have to agree with what is mentioned. As far as the scientists are concerned, they have a different philosophy. They have a different approach. This approach is known as the falsification test. The scientists, they are so busy. There are so many new theories coming about. They don't have time to analyze it. They say, if you have a theory, first give us a way to prove your theory wrong. If you come about with a new concept, first give us a way, show us a way how to prove your theory wrong. Albert Einstein, in the beginning of the 20th century, he proposed certain things. How does the universe work? Along with it, he gave three ways how to prove his theory wrong. The scientist, they examined for six years, and then they agreed it was right. Now, anyone who gives a falsification test, it deserves to be heard. It doesn't mean the person is great or the work is great. It may be right, may be wrong. But anyone who gives the falsification test, it deserves to be heard. There are innumerable falsification tests mentioned in the Quran. 
you want to prove the Quran wrong, it is very easy you try it out. Very easy. There are some falsification tests which was meant only for that time when the Quran was revealed. Some is meant for today, some it will be meant till the last day. I'll just mention about four or five because of lack of time. One very good example is about the story of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, he was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad and he was given this nickname, Abu Lahab, the father of the flame, and he was one of the staunchest enemies of the Prophet. Whenever we saw anyone speaking with the Prophet, he used to wait. Moment the Prophet left, he used to go to the man and ask him, what did the Prophet say? Did he say black? It is white. Did he say day? No, it is night. He used to speak the opposite. He was one of the staunchest enemies of the Prophet. He went out of the way, he even lied many a times just to prove the Prophet wrong. Now there is a surah in the Quran by the name Surah Lahab, chapter number 111, which all of us know very well. It's recited many times in the Salah, Tabba, Tada, Abi Lahab, Yuvatab, etc. In this surah it is mentioned that Abu Lahab and his wife, they will burn in the hellfire, indicating they will never become Muslims. They will never ever accept Islam. Now this surah was revealed about 10 years before the death of Abu Lahab. When this surah was revealed, only thing Abu Lahab had to do was accept Islam and the Quran would have been proved wrong. Not actually. Many of his companions who were his friends in the span of 10 years they accepted Islam. Abu Lahab, later on after 10 years, he died in the Battle of Badr. 10 years he had time. The Prophet was constantly reminding him for 10 years, you accept Islam and the Quran will be proved wrong. So easy. Only thing he had to do was say, I am a Muslim. Finish. Not that he had to behave like a Muslim. Not that he had to offer Salah. Only thing he had to say, I'm a Muslim, and finish. The Quran had been proved wrong. So easy. Very easy. He had lied many times against the Prophet. He had to lie once again. And the Quran would have been proved wrong. But he could not. Because the author of the Quran is Almighty God. He knows that Abu Lahab will never accept Islam. Falsification test. Ten years. There's another falsification test. Many, many are there. It's mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two. Verse number 94 95. There was a group of Jews who were having a confrontation with the Muslims. And they say that the last home with Allah is only for us. So Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter two, verse 94 95, that if they say the last home with Allah is only for them, so ask them to call for death. If you say that surely the last home with Allah, Akhirat is for you, then call for death. And the verse continues, they will never call for death. Never. Only thing these Jews had to do to prove the Quran wrong was say, I want to die. So easy. Not that they had to die. Not that they had to commit suicide. Not that they had to stab themselves. Only thing they had to say is, I want to die. So easy. To prove the Quran wrong, you want to say, I want to die. Four words, Quran will be proved wrong. Allah continues in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 95 and 96. They will never call for death, even if a thousand years was given to them. So easy. So easy to prove the Quran wrong. Now, these two falsification tests were falsification tests of the past. Now you'll ask me, Brother Zakir, today I want to prove the Quran wrong. How can I prove it wrong today? Can I do it today? Yes, everyone has a chance. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 82, that for the believers, the closest to the believers are those people who say that we are Christians. 
and the furthest away, the staunchest enemies are those who say we're Jews and pagans. The Quran says, the staunchest enemies of the believers are the Jews and the pagans. And the closest to the believers are those who say we are Christians. As a whole, the Quran is talking as a whole. There are many Jews who have accepted Islam. There may be few Jews who are better than the Christians, but as a whole, the Quran says, the Jews are the enemies of the Muslim as a whole. And the Christians are closer. Only thing to prove the Quran wrong, now all the Jews of the world, they get together and they plan. Okay, let's be good to the Muslim for a few years, or two, three years, better than the Christians. Quran is proved wrong. So easy. All the Jews of the world get together. For three, four years, we'll be good to the Muslims. And then we'll say this verse of the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 82, is wrong. They will never do it. They will never be able to do it. Easy. There are other falsification tests. You will say, I'm not a Jew. But I want to prove the Quran wrong. How can I prove it? Allah has given everyone a chance. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 88, do they say he forged it? Try and produce a Quran like unto it. I mean, do you say the Quran is forged? Try and produce a Quran like it. The same challenge is repeated in Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 34, Allah challenges. They try and produce a Quran like it, and you'll never be able to do it. Even if all the jinns and the humankind gather together, they will never be able to produce the like of the Quran without the help of Allah. It's a challenge. Now Allah makes the challenge easier. Allah says in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 13, do they say he forged it? Produce 10 surahs forged like unto it. Not the whole Quran, difficult. Forget it, that challenge is difficult. Produce 10 surahs like the Quran. And call forth for help anyone besides Allah. And you'll never be able to do it. Allah makes the challenge easier, much easier. In Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 38. Do they say he forged it? Produce one surah like it. One. Not the whole Quran. Not ten surah. One surah like it. And call forth for help anyone who you want besides Allah, and you'll not be able to do it. No response. Now, Allah makes the test much easier. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 23 and 24, Allah says, Wa in kuntum fi mimma nazzalna al -abdina. And if you are in doubt, as what we have revealed to our servant from time to time, fatu bi surati mimmisli. Produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Mimmisli. It's not misli. Mimmisli means somewhat similar. Not exactly like the Quran. Try and produce one surah somewhat similar to the Quran. Mimmisli. Wad u shuwada akuminunillah in kundum sadikin. Call forth for help and witnesses. Anyone you want besides Allah. If you speak the truth. Fail lam taf alu. But if you cannot. Walantaf alu and of a surety cannot. And be prepared for the fire whose fuel is men and stones. You will not be able to do it, and of a surety you cannot do it. And be prepared for the fire whose fuel is men and stones. This is a challenge. Try it and produce a surah somewhat similar to it. Now you'll tell me, but natural, if it is a test. You have to produce the surah in Arabic. So the brother Zakir, I don't know Arabic, so how can I take part in this test? I said, fine. If you have produced a surah like the Quran, it has to be in Arabic. It can't be in English, can't be in French, can't be in Hindi, can't be in Urdu. Many people tried, not that they didn't try. Many hundreds of people tried and they failed miserably. They were able to rhyme it, but went away from reality. Many people tried and many are available in the books, but all of them failed miserably. Now you'll ask me, the brother Zakir. I don't know Arabic. I'm not a Jew. How can I try and prove the Quran wrong? There are many falsification tests. 
I'll give you one more. Where anyone can take part. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 82, which says, Afala yadatakaroon al Quran, walau kana minindi gerilla, lava jadu fiqh talafan kasira. Do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, anyone besides Almighty God, there would have been many contradictions. So if you want to prove the Quran wrong, only thing you have to do is take out a single contradiction in the Quran. If anyone takes out a single contradiction in the Quran, the Quran will be proved wrong. Not that people did not try. Many people tried. You go on the internet, you will find a thousand contradictions. But all of them, either out of context or mistranslation or illogical. So this is called as a falsification test. So Quran shows us a way how to prove itself wrong. If you think it's not from God, you want to prove it wrong, try it. Take out a single contradiction, the Quran will be proved wrong. This is called as the falsification test. Anyone who believes in God will immediately agree if he's unbiased with what I've said in the last one hour, he'll have to agree that the Quran is from God. But what about a person who does not believe in God himself? If a person does not believe in God, where is the question of Quran being a word of God? So now we have dealt with the majority of the people, but yet there is a large percentage who are atheist who do not believe in God himself. How do we deal with them? When I meet an atheist, and if he says that he does not believe in God, the first thing I do is, I congratulate that atheist. Now you may wonder, that why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I'm congratulating him is because most of the human beings, they are doing blind belief. Most of the Christians, the Christians, because their father is a Christian. He's a Hindu, because the father is a Hindu. Some of them are Muslims, because their father is a Muslim. They aren't thinking. This person, he's thinking. He may be coming from a religious background, but he may not agree that the God which his parents are worshipping is what to be called as God. The reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said, the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is prove to him, Illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. To the other non Muslims, to the other non Muslims, first, I have to prove to him that the God he's worshipping is false. So half the time I waste in trying to prove that the God is worshipping is false. Here, half my job is done, la ilaha. Only thing left for me is illa Allah and then Muhammad Rasulullah. But Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. Now this atheist, he rejects God because he has the wrong concept of God. Now anyone who says he does not believe in God, first I'll ask him, what is the definition of God? For anyone to reject anything, he should know its definition. For example, if I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you should know the definition of pen. If you don't know the definition of pen, you cannot say this is not a pen. Is it clear? Do you agree with me or not? If I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you have to know the definition of pen, otherwise, you cannot logically say it's not a pen. There was a smart person. He said, no, Brother Zakir. I know that's a book. So even if I don't know the definition of a pen, I can say it's not a pen. I know it's a book. 
So why should I know the definition of pen? So I said, fine. Do you know that's a book? He says, yes. I say, this, this is a kitab. If he said, no, it's not a kitab. He knows the definition of book, but does not know the definition of kitab. Kitab, in Arabic, and Urdu, means a book. If I say this is a pen, knowing definition of a pen is more important than knowing what is this. Same way, if a person says there's no God, I'll first ask him, what is the definition of God? The definition they give is when they see that a God tells a lie, a God can be defeated, the God, he can be killed. So when we hear all these stories of God telling a lie, a God can be defeated, a God can be killed, a God can die, a God requires to eat, so they reject the God. Who are they rejecting? They are rejecting the false gods, La Ilaha. Similarly, someone, if he believes that Islam is a religion of terrorism, Islam is a merciless religion, Islam is an unscientific religion, Islam is a religion which does not give rights to the woman, and he rejects this Islam, I say, even I reject such Islam. Because I know that Islam is a merciful religion. Islam, it's a scientific religion. Islam has human rights. Islam has women rights. So what do I do? I tell him, the Islam you believe and you reject, it should be rejected, but true Islam is, then I present to him the true Islam. Similarly, when these people are rejecting the false God, we have to present to them what is the true God. And the best definition of Almighty God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given in the Quran, is from Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say, He is Allah one and only. Allahu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yirid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kuffan ahad. There is nothing like Him. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any person saying that so-and-so person is God, if that person fits in this four-line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that person as God. The first is, Kul wallawad, says Allah one and only. Second is, Allah samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam milid wa lam yulad, he begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufanad, there is nothing like him. There are many people who say that Dajnish, he is Almighty God. Let us put this Bhagwan Dajnish to the test of Surah class. There's a person who asked me a question at the time, that Brother Zakir, we Hindus do not believe in Bhagwan Dajnish to be God. I never said that Hindus believe Bhagwan Dajnish to be God. I've read the Hindu scripture. Nowhere do the Hindu scriptures say Bhagwan Dajnish is God. I said some human beings, some people believe Bhagwan Dajnish to be God. Let us put this Bhagwan Dajnish to the test of Surah class. The first is, Qul hu Allah ahad. Says Allah one and only. Was Bhagwan Dajnish one and only? Was he the only man who claimed divinity? There are hundreds who have claimed divinity. And in this country alone, there are thousands who have claimed that they were gods. He's not the only one. But the Rajnish Bhakt will say, no, he is one and only, he is unique. Let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajnish absolute and eternal? We know from the autobiography of Rajnish, he says that he was suffering from asthma, from chronic backache, from diabetes mellitus. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, chronic backache, diabetes mellitus. Third test is, Lam yulid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. We know Bhagavan Rajnish, he was born in Madhya Pradesh, and later on, in 1981, he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride, and in the state of Oregon, he starts his village called as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government, they arrest him, and they put him behind bars. And Rajnish, he alleges that the American government, they slow poisoned me in the prison. Imagine, Almighty God being slow poisoned. Later on, the American government, the king of the country, he comes back to India and goes back to the city of Pune 
where he has a center, which is now called as Osho Commune. And when you go to the center, if you go to Samadhi, it is mentioned there on Samadhi, Bhagavan Rajnish, Osho, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died. But visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention on a samadhi that he was not given visas to more than 21 countries of the world. <laughs> Almighty God coming to visit the world and he requires visas. And the Archbishop of Greece said that if you don't remove Rajnish out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciple. And the last test, there's nothing like him, is so stringent that no one besides the true Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, to anyone in the universe, he's not God. There's nothing like him. Suppose someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You might have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. World, the strongest man in the world, Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh, whether it be King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. You know Bhagavan Rajnish, he wore white clothes, he had a beard, he had two eyes like the human beings, one nose, two hands. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. Otherwise, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belong the most beautiful name. You can call Allah by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. It should be a name given by himself. And this message, besides being mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 110, it's also mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 180, in Surah Ta'a, chapter number 20, verse number 8, as well as Surah Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 24, that to Allah belong the most beautiful name. Many of the atheists, they believe in science. All these arguments may not satisfy them completely. Many of the atheists, they say that science is a yardstick. They believe science is ultimate. So let's try and prove to this group of atheists also about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I know that this atheist believes only in science, after congratulating him, I'll ask him a simple question. That if suppose there is equipment, there is a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, and if that gadget is bought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this gadget? That atheist, he may say, after thinking for a while, the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of a gadget who no one in the world has ever seen, no one in the world knows about it, he will tell you that the creator of that gadget. Or he may say the maker of the gadget. He may say the inventor, he may say the producer, he may say the manufacturer. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Either creator, manufacturer, producer, maker, inventor, somewhat similar. Just keep that answer at the back of your mind. The second person is the creator, if he says to somebody else, he'll come to know, or a person who does research, but that is secondary. You ask this atheist that how did our universe come into existence? So he will tell you that our universe was initially one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, stars, moon, sun, and the earth on which we live. This he calls as the big bang. You ask him, when did you come to know about this creation of the universe, about the big bang? He will tell you about 50 years back. 
40 years back. So you tell him, this thing what you're mentioning about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where Allah says, Avalam yaral lazina kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan atrat kan fatakna huma. That the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about, the Big Bang, is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So he will tell, maybe it's a fluke. Somebody wrote it. No problem. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. What is the shape of the earth? So he will tell you, previously the human beings thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake, he sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You tell him. That the Quran mentions in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, that Wal Ard ba da zalika dahaha. We have made the earth X shape. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is an expanse, and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And we know today that the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is starting from the pole and bulging from the center. It is geospherical in shape. It is somewhat similar to the egg. And the Arabic word duya does not refer to a normal leg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, it is geospherical in shape. Imagine the Quran mentioned that the earth is geospherical 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So he will tell you, ah, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an intelligent man. Don't argue. Continue. The light of the moon. Is it its own line of reflected light? So the atheist will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But today we know that the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. When did you come to know? He will tell you, we came to know yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61. That blessed is he who hath placed the constellation in the sky. And therein, Sun, Shams having its own light, and Moon having borrowed light. The Arabic word for sun is Shams. Its light is always described as Siraj of Ahaj, meaning a torch or a blazing lamp. And the Moon in Arabic is called as Kamar. Its light is always described as Munir or Noor. Munir means borrowed light, and Noor means a reflection of light. And nowhere is the moonlight described as Vahaj or Siraj. It's always described as Noor or Munir. Borrowed light or reflection of light. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 14 years ago? Now there'll be a pause. Don't wait for the reply. Continue. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun revolved, but it was stationary. It did not rotate about its axis. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, wa nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day, wa shamsa wa kamar, the sun and the moon, kullun fi falaki yasbahoon, each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yasbahoon describes the motion of a moving body. And if it's talking about a celestial body, it means that this sun and the moon, besides revolving, it's also rotating about its own axis. And today science tells us that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. Imagine what I read in school. I finished my school in 1982. Sun was stationary. 1400 years before the Quran says the sun rotates. And my science book said the sun was stationary. Today, it has been incorporated that the sun rotates. You ask him, that who could have mentioned this? There'll be a silent pause. Some critics will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy because the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree, the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the subject of hydrology, when you ask the atheist, that you ask him about the water cycle, he will tell you that the water evaporates from the ocean. It forms into clouds. The clouds move into the interior. It falls down as rain, and the water is replenished. We ask him, when did you come to know this? He will tell you it was in 1580 
when Sir Bernard Palissy, he spoke about the water cycle for the first time, 1580. So you tell him what you came to know in 1580, just hardly a couple of hundred years before. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago. The Quran says, the water evaporated from the ocean, formed into the clouds. The clouds move and join. They move into the interior, and they fall down as rain, and the water is replenished. The water cycle is spoken in the Quran in great detail in several places. Mention in Surah Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It's mentioned in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 12 to 14. It's mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse 57. In Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 17. It's mentioned in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 40 and 49. It's mentioned in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. It's mentioned in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. It's mentioned in Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. It's mentioned in Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 67 to 70. It's mentioned in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and go on and go on, quoting only the verses in the Quran which speak about the water cycle only.